have a little bit of delay as you as you are well aware. So I'm going to go straight into it. Um, William may have already told you this, but I'll say it very quickly. The idea behind um, Black Pack is that, and the interviews, is that I'm sure you have heard the terminology standing on giant shoulders. So what we have decided to do is that we have decided to get hold of these giants and we are going to be interviewing some of the giants so that they can tell us their stories and give us insight into their life experiences and what they draw on for guidance, inspiration and sustenance. But we do this by actually asking them what's in their backpack in their black pack and what tools what wisdom what things have they gained in their journey that they can share with us and i am delighted to tell you and i know you know that that our first guest is margaret busby today margaret busby obe publisher editor writer broadcaster and literary critic um, in the 1960s margaret busby became britain's first well the first and youngest black female book publisher and over a decade she's had an extensive career devoted to literature publishing and diversity last year for example in 2020 margaret chaired the booker prize judging panel in 2019 in the black history month in the uk zadie smith the well-known author said and i quote margaret has been a cheerleader an instigator an organizer defender and a celebrator of black arts for the past 50 years shouting about us from the rooftops, even when few people cared to listen. She has helped change the landscape of both UK publishing and arts coverage, and so many Black British artists owe her a debt. I know I do, end of quote. So this evening, you have waited for a long time, and we are very grateful. Welcome Margaret Busby, OBE. Margaret is our first giant whose shoulders we have stood on and who we were going to be speaking to. Welcome, Margaret. Thanks. Thank you much. I keep talking about me as a giant. I'm only five foot two and a half. Well, Margaret, that's even better because at five foot two and a half, you have done so many amazing things. Now, I'm going to get straight into it because we have been waiting. And the first thing I want to ask is this. You know, when I look up and we look up uh, things about you on the Internet and read various articles, one of the many of the pieces start by saying with this sentence, Margaret Busby, born in Ghana, educated in the UK, Britain's youngest and first black woman publisher, when in 1967 she co-founded Alison and Busby with Clive Allison. That's not the question. My question is, it goes from Margaret Busby, born in Ghana, educated in UK, and it jumps to the other things. Can you give us, Margaret, any insight into your childhood and youth that may have helped to have nurtured your journey into the arts and the literary world where we mainly place you now? Well, um, you do say that all the time, and I wish they wouldn't. I mean, it, it, okay, it may, it may be true that I was a young thing. That's not the point. I, I was born in Ghana, yes. I came over to British school when I was quite young, and that was because my father, who was actually born in Barbados, he went, went to Trinidad when he was six weeks old, so he grew up in Trinidad. His father was a tailor, so he didn't have lots of expectations of expensive education but he was bright so he got his education by scholarships he he won the island scholarship he was actually at school with clr james who is another trinidadian hero and he came to britain he he studied men's medicine he became a doctor and after he qualified he, he worked for 10 years in uh, east end of london but then he edged the ghana and he was a doctor in the bush as we called it um, where there were not many um, you know, schools or opportunities to send your children to school. So my brother and my sister and I uh, were sent to school in Britain because my father had, and, and my mother too, had, had great belief in the British education because my father had gone to school in Trinidad um, at, at, to, to a school called Queen's Royal College, which was a, a sort of British public school fact school if you like one of the premier institutions and my, my mother had also um had to work hard she studied a, as a nurse in in britain and she went back to ghana she was a nursing sister and they they uh, wanted to give us the best opportunities so we came over here my sister my brother and i and we were at boarding school 
And so that was where I, education, my parents had to make lots of sacrifices. They, they, you know, they couldn't, uh, in fact, my mother once, when she had one dress, she would wear in a day, wash at night and wear the next day so that she could save money to, to send to pay for our schooling. So there were lots of sacrifices that my parents made. And that was the start of wherever I am now, started from what I got from my parents. They didn't leave us money, but they left us principles. They gave us an education. And that was the beginning of my journey. Thank you. Thanks very much Does for that. that. Your question? I can't <laughs> that was quick, but it did give us some insight and so many things resonate in terms of when you hear many other people's story about the sacrifices their parents made um, and, and so on. And this whole thing about the belief in the British education system. So I'm going to go straight in then and ask you, as we said, the premise of this, um, this event is that we're going to ask you to share with us from your Black Pack. Share with us wisdom, tools, things that have helped you on your journey. So I'm going to go straight in and ask you about to share that first thing. What is the first item that you're going to pull out of your pack to share with us and tell us why you have chosen that particular item? Wow, well, that's that. We expect this to be like that quickly. Well, I mean, one of the things I'll have, okay, one of the, the trend items I have is this uh, book that was given to my father by C.L.R. James. It's inscribed for George Rowe, and it's a copy of Amy Cesar's book, Return to My Native Land. Now, I'm not sure why my father was given that about C.L.R., but when, when I started publishing C.L.R. James, one of the selection, collections of selected writings that we published used a, a quote from this as the title, and the quote was, no race holds the monopoly of beauty, of intelligence, of strength. And there is a place for all, a rendezvous of victory. And I think that is saying something about the inclusivity of the world. I mean, we don't have to make a special effort. No race holds the monopoly of, of intelligence, of strength. And there's a place for all at the rendezvous of victory. So I think we can all be curious if we have that sort of a uh, view of the, so this return to my little land inscribed to my my father uh, CLR to my father is one of my my special items I'll have in the backpack and well, I ought to say that I, I think I'd like to have a diction can I have a dictionary as well yes <laughs> in my black back <laughs> I, I learned to I learned to to read and write when I was quite young and I remember the first three words I learned to spell it was when one of my Trinidadian cousins was visiting uh, in school, so I was probably about four. My cousin David decided he was going to teach my elder to spell, and he chose some difficult words, and he kept repeating them and drumming them to my brother, and I learned these words by default. So here's me, three years old. Like the first three words I learned to spell were fascinating, necessary and picturesque and i think that's a metaphor for the way life should be fascinating necessary and picturesque okay thank you but i'm going to go in a little bit further with that first point you said about the book uh, in terms of no race um is is you know it's actually more special prominent than any other tell us about because one of the things we see is you doing a lot of pushing in terms of having you know we could say in some ways as the pushback for black and brown people but even if it's not a pushback what we know and one of the reasons why we're speaking with you is that the difference you made in allowing helping inspiring black and brown people and a lot of women in particular when i think of the the your the book that you have actually edited in terms of daughters of africa and what you did to actually give a voice so can you just speak a little bit more about this whole thing about the this race being, you know, the equality and how it has been impacted, how you I have been. I think one of the things that we have to be aware of is the, the necessity for us to be able to tell our own stories, to disseminate our own stories. Now, although you, you talk a lot about, you know, or people talk a lot about it being the first this or the youngest that, I think you have to realize that there are other people that inspire us. One of, in fact, 
first book publisher in this country was John LaRose of New Beacon Books. And although I didn't know him when I started, he, he, New Beacon Books started in 1966. And my company, Alison and Buzz, started the next year. Uh, and I knew nothing because I I'd left, I'd left university when I was 20. And, and by that time, I'd already the idea of a publishing company. So you can tell I didn't have any knowledge of life in general, let alone what the publishing world should be like. So I think it was, and, and of course I, I, I did meet John and work with John and also with Jessica Huntley, who's another pioneer in, in terms of black publishing in, in Britain. So we all were kind of part of the same push, if you like. And, and one of the important ventures that came out in, in, in the eighties and, and lasted, and it came out of the unity between and Race to Day publications eventually was the International Book Fair of Record Black and Third World Books. Now that was an, a key event which last, what happened every year initially. And that was something that showcased not only publications and publishers and the works and creativity of, of people of African descent, black people in, general, in this country, but around the world, you know, in every continent, because everybody came to the Black Book Fair. So I think it's it's important to remember those sorts of initiatives. And surely I, I, I did the anthology Daughters of Africa in 1992 and New Daughters of Africa in 2019, was it, or was it last year? Yeah, 2019. Year old. No, the year before last, my goodness. Yeah, and that was simply to make the point that there are a lot of women of African descent who deserved to be read and enjoyed who are not. And that was simply because well, I remember very clearly, I would get, I would buy a copy of books, a book play of short stories from the Caribbean. as still one or two of those in, in the early days, normally from the educational publishers. And it wouldn't say by men, but you wouldn't find many women in it or, you know, Kirchhoff from Africa, not necessarily by men, but where are the women? restore the balance, if you like, in, in, in those um, omissions. And I think we all should just take the view that the world of literature becomes richer if we stop excluding people. Mm -hmm. And I think that has been my mission all along. It's not to say that I don't read books unless they're by black writers or black women writers. I, I read all sorts of things. And obviously I had to for the Booker Prize. So it's, it's, it's not an exclusive thing. It's not even to focus, it's just the way that things that should be. There is a lot of good writing and there's a lot of important question, publish, publishing that's being done. And we want to give it all the opportunity to reach as many people as possible, to enrich everybody's lives. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Certainly, uh, in terms of I, I can um, concur with you saying that you don't just read books. Sorry, I realize I was muted again. I'm saying I certainly can concur with you and you say you do not read books just by black and brown people or by women. Because if any of you have seen some of the other pictures of Margaret in her office and Margaret in anywhere else where there are books, uh, you have to fight and fall over the books before you can find Margaret. Um, there are all sorts of books, every book you can find, and she has been on the judging panel for so many book prizes that, yeah, uh, she, she's out there with lots and lots of books. So we know that, but let's ask about your second item, Margaret. So the first one was, as you said, that book that was given by CLR. James, what is the second item you'd like to share with us and give us some background and the story behind that one? An item? What sort of item do you have, have in mind? <laughs> some music. <laughs> music. <laughs> and we'll get to that later, do we? Yeah, whichever one, you, your choice. Tell us which one you want to go to. Well, one of the things, I, I mean, we've talked about words, and one of the things that is important to me is when we talk about standing on the shoulders of, shoulders of giants or whatever, passing the baton, is to share any information with other people. And so there are a couple of precepts, if you like, that that's kind of, I, I think I got, got them through the way my parents operated their lives. And they are things by which I live. And one of them, well, I'll paraphrase, because it's something I was doing before I actually found this quotation. And it goes something like, 
It's amazing what you can accomplish there who takes the credit. You're not doing something so somebody says, oh, you know, well done you, or you're the best, the first that. You're doing it because you think it needs to be done, it will it, be done. You're doing it not for a byline, not for any particular reward, but you're doing it to try and I guess, just to make the world a better place, to pass on information. And the other quotation about, which kind of, again, relates to passing on information. And this was something I, I first heard a version of this. I saw a version of this on, on, on an email from a, a friend of mine, who's now a friend, who's a, a Ghanaian photographer, an important photographer called James Barnell, who's now in his 90s. And he used to have at the bottom of his email something to the effect, plant trees under which you will never sit. And I think that's a variation of a Greek saying, which was something like, a society grows, a society thrives when older people plant trees on which they will sit. And I think that again speaks to passing on information and sharing whatever you have with other people. So those are the two precepts that come in my life. And I'd like to pass those on to anybody who, who wants to think about them and, and perhaps try and do the same in different, whatever way they can. Okay, thank you so much for that. While you were speaking, I was looking at something and to find this little quote that you had said, which I think supports that. You said some time ago, it's easy enough to be the first. We can each try something and be first, the first woman or the first African woman to do X, Y, and Z. But if it's something worthwhile, you don't want to be the only. And I hope I can in any way inspire someone to do what I have done, but to learn from my mistakes and do better than I have done. And I think that seems to resonate um, with what you've just said about this whole thing about planting trees that you may not sit on and so on. Now, how does it, what comes to mind when you think about the number of people who will cite you as being this inspiration, who've helped them to find their voice, to get their voice and to be out there? I am I'm thrilled if I have inspired me to, to either to write or to publish. And I certainly think more involved on uh, the publishing side. Although, of course, we want writers to be published in the best possible way, to have the best editors, to be promoted in the right way. And, and to all those ends, the Writers Guild was formed a few months ago. But I think we also need to be aware of the fact that we need to have a presence in the publishing. And I think there are people who I think have been inspired by the fact that I was a publisher, try and be publishers themselves. And I think one of the ways I could even have influenced people or inspired people is people who thought, well, if that young thing can do it, anybody can. Because <laughs> if I could start a publishing company at the age of whatever it was, 20, or without any money or, or experience or anything, then it can be done. All you can do is do your best. And, and, and take one step at a time. And I think we still need to try and a way to have a presence. Great. Um, good night, everybody. Um, I just wanted to add my thanks, Margaret. Oh, you know, when they say um, you, you confer on somebody a, a knighthood, whether it's writing, as our first Black Pack host, editing, we want to confer on you uh, the order of the Black Hood, <laughs> the services <laughs> to our when community that we greatly uh, appreciate. Thank you. I greatly accept. But I think it needs to... Yeah. So people can um, put their cameras on and give them some claps and thank our wonderful interviewee tonight. Outside London. We just need to have listen a to some music as we go out. So have a enjoy the rest of your evening. Before I go, Margaret, to my next uh, quest question about your backpack, I just wanted to ask this one. You know, you spent a number of years and, you know, a lot of your life in different forms in the publishing. It, how did you press through when the challenge of publishing became too great or it just became really heavy? How, how did you keep going? Because I'm sure at times it must have been pretty tough. Well, it, it's always tough. I mean, it's, it's hard to do anything that just requires a lot of energy. The thing is, 
if you're doing something you believe in and that's something that you enjoy and I I have done different things. I mean, with the publishing company, I was there for 20 years and another company called Earthscan, we published people like Ernst Banner, but then I moved on and I've been freelancing in different ways for, you know, the best part of the three decades. So, since I've been my own boss and, and I've never had a lot of money when we started out, um, at Alison and Busby, there were three of us actually, and we, we were sharing a thousand pounds a year three ways. So some weeks we had seven pounds, some weeks we had six pounds. So I was doing all sorts of other things to uh, make up the difference. I was at that point married to a jazz musician who had no money either. <laughs> and so I was doing work in publishing, I was doing a, a, a program for the BBC African Service, I was doing freelance work for central office of information a television program called london line i was doing a lot of different things doing bits of writing and so it was just uh, even as a publisher we, we didn't have money necessarily in the bank we had to think well have we got enough money now to do the next book and if we did then we could go ahead so we were just going one step at a time not over stretching ourselves trying to do things that we believed in that other people didn't necessarily do themselves so we were making our own pathway, if you like, without you know, looking at what conventional, conventional way of doing things was. And also getting support from a lot of friends and you know, whether I, I've mentioned people like um, Jessica Huntley and Don LaRose, who were good friends of mine. And, you know, I participated in the Black Book Fair and, you know, we helped each other. Uh, sometimes Jessica would, you know, I did index for a book of Jessica's or, you know, she'd ask me how to sell this or whatever. So we were all in the same bubble, if you like. And I think that's what you need to do. We need to support each other in whatever way we can. And it's not a question of one of us getting in and closing the door afterwards. It's a question of leading other people with us mm -hmm. so that, you know, that, that's all I can say. I, 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 I'm happy to have the spotlight on me because it gives me a chance to tell other people, you know, how, how to do what I've done. But it's not to say that I am better or, or know more, okay. but I will certainly share what I know with whoever needs to. I, I, one of the things I, I, I find myself doing occasionally is, is holding the hand of other people who are, have become publishers and they've run into some problem and I will get a WhatsApp message or an email, what should I do about this? And I'm happy to give my point of view. So long may that, that continue. It's helped a lot of people. It's helped a lot of people. I'm going to go on one, one last point before I ask for the next item. And that is you've mentioned Jessica Huntley a number of times and, um, and, and John LaRose as two, two people who, as you said, working together, supporting each other. Uh, just tell us a little bit more about who Jessica Huntley is, please. Well, I think you need to have a special about Jessica. Jessica was the fa founder of Vogel Louverture um, Publications, um, which started in 1969 with a, with a book by Walter Rodney called How You're in Underdeveloped Africa. And we were just good friends uh, right up until she died. In fact, I'm wearing still a bracelet that I had um, when she died and it has her date of birth and date of death on it. And in fact, quite often, it was quite funny. We, we, we had a, a great time giggling together about a lot of things. Although, you know, both she and John were big people compared to me, you know, they were a generation ahead of me. But people might phone me up in the interview and I'd say, well, no, why don't you just phone up Jessica Huntley? She's more interesting. And they'd say, well, we phoned her up and she said, phone you up. So we had this sort of to and fro because neither of us were particularly keen on, you know, being in the limelight just for its own sake. So Jessica is certainly somebody who, together with Eric Huntley, her husband, made a lot of contributions to publishing, to educate black, children's education to all sorts of things as did John LaRose in Britain and and also internationally so I, these are names that I, I repeat because they shouldn't be forgotten they, they should be their, their books should be known about I mean as I mentioned um, 
Walter Rodney was somebody that Jessica published. John LaRose published uh, the first novel that was published in Britain by, by C.L.R. James or Minty Alley. Actually, I, I did a play in Minty Alley. That, that, it came out in 1936. I think New Beacon reissued it in about 1971. I did a play of it in about 1990 something. And it is still you know, a notable book. And it's the first novel by a, a Black Caribbean person, Black writer published in this country in the 30s. So that was something Beacon kept in print and a lot of other titles, which are important. So between us all, I mean, we, we shared people, authors in common. I, I published Andrew Salky's poetry. Jessica published Andrew Salky. You know, we, we shared cover designers. Errol Lloyd designed covers, I think, for New Beacon Books, for Bogle Louvershaw and Ballast and Busby. So there were lots of, there was a lot of overlap in the way we worked. We, we, shared, we had a, a printer called Billiards Press, and one by somebody called John Sankey. He was really a wonderful guy because he was, he, he let us all use his uh, print. He printed books for us all, but wasn't that tough on, on, um, the fact that we didn't have that, you know, we, we had a lot of things in common. We were all trying to make our way step by step, doing what we believed in and, and trying to make a difference to the way works by black writers and other writers were disseminated in this country and around the world. Thank, thank you for that. And I think, yeah, and, and we have seen that and, and I, I asked to clarify it about Jessica Huntley because in a sense she's another one of the giants that she can't speak for herself now because she is no more with us but the 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 theme and the strong point we're getting through is this whole thing about supporting each other and being there for each other and pressing on if you believe in something so it takes me to asking you for your third item that item and remember when I say item it could be a piece of wisdom but you know we know a saying a book a piece of music what is the next bit of wisdom on the journey that you'd like to share with us please well i i, I love music so i would like to be so one of the things one of the sadnesses i've had last year was that my wonderful sister who was again a wonderful support in every way to me she, she died she had cancer and she had been not only in terms of being a wonderful sister, and she's probably the person who I'd spend more time with all my life because we you know we were together from childhood and in London. And she, you mentioned my anthology, this new Doors of Africa, and Eileen did a lot of the translations in here. In fact, this is a new paperback edition, and, and it's dedicated to Eileen. And she affected so many people. She was uh, somebody again who. I think got a lot of her precepts from uh, she was a great connector she was a great sharer i used to joke never say to her, i like that dress because she'd take it off and give it to you so she was always giving and she had the gift, high or low i mean like my my father i remember when he was a doctor you know, people would come and visit us in Suhum, where we, the village where my father's clinic was, and they'd sit and eat with us, and you didn't know whether they were you know, dustmen or ministers. They were just people, and so you related people for who they were, and that's certainly something that Eileen has given me and gave to a lot of people. The number of people who I've connected with because of Eileen, because of the way she did. I'm talking about people she met in the street, people she gave a lift to, who she then stayed friends with, who helped. She helped all her life. And she also connected with the people who, to me, who became family friends. For example, on the day my sister died in May last year, she had a message from Stevie Wonder, who was a friend, who was a family friend actually, but she first met him in the 70s when she interviewed him. She also worked for the so for the 70s until the present day, Stevie has been a wonderful help and support. And on the day my sister died, he sent a message to another good family friend, Andrea Rosario, 
And this was a link to a piece of music that he actually sang on Martin Luther King Day last year. It was from his album, Inner Visions. This was a, a tune called Visions. And I would like to have that because it reminds me of so many things. I love Steve's music anyway, brilliant musician. I love him to death. It reminds me of Eileen, it reminds me of my and Andrea, it reminds me of all sorts of wonderful things. And you know, I would like to share that. I, and we are going to, um, because we knew that one. So I'm going to ask um, Wayne, are you able to just give us a little piece of that one? Thank you very much for that, Wayne. Thank you. Thank you. That's just a really small snippet of um, that particular track. And, uh, and, and I know, as you've said that, you know, they, they've been a wonderful friendship and that that's been really fully appreciated. And also, I know when we've spoken in the past, you've talked about one piece of music, music. There are so many important pieces, um, but whatever Stevie puts out, it's a big thing for you. Now, I'm going to move on a little bit now to ask about uh, the next item. So <clears throat> this is going to be... How many items am I going to have? <laughs> this is the... Is this our fourth? Um, can you tell us, I mean, so because you've talked to us a little bit about the, the book, you've talked about the piece of music, you've talked about... So tell us the next item. What's the next piece, please, that you want to share with us? Wow. Friendship. What, what's there to say? Friendship, dancing. I love dancing. Um, I get dancing with my partner Luke whenever we can. Sometimes it's just around the sitting room. But I'm not sure. I'm just, keep listening to music, keep dancing, keep active. And, uh, you know, value your friendships. And, you know, what else is there to say? Love friendship, sisterhood, those are all things that matter to me. And I think we should all try and um, make the most of those things. Thank you, thank you, Margaret. Thank you. Thank you for actually sharing those points with us. It's not over yet because we, you know, I know we started a bit late, but there have been some questions that people wish to ask, but, mm -hmm. um, it, I, you know, picking up on that last point, this whole thing, there is that theme about friendship, about supporting, about valuing others, um, about recognizing um, where, you know, the, the part that we play and that we, we build things, not just for ourselves, but for other people. And certainly that's one of the things that in the time I have known you, that's, that seems to be a consistent theme that even if you don't say it, a lot you certainly live it and many many people because again one of the latest thing I've written is where you know it's, you know the, the points being made if you know what here is this legend that's around and so often we just don't hear that much so we are absolutely delighted as to the bits we have heard now I'm going to ask you a couple of questions that's come up in the chat um, and one of them is to say I wonder how you know this thing about what is your some of you know to give us some idea of your favorite authors oh dear they actually ask about five authors. Who are Margaret's top five authors? Five authors. Why? No, and I, I don't. I don't like hierarchical, you know, ranking authors in that way. But one of the people I always turn to for wisdom in her writing, particularly her essays, is Toni Morrison. So Toni Morrison would certainly be one of the people that I would, uh, in my, you know, any list I did. There are just so many different writers, and it's it's difficult to say these are the top five or you know 
input of another because you read different things in different moods. Sometimes you want to read poetry, sometimes you want to read essays, sometimes you want to read fiction. And, and that's one of the things that I like about um, the anthology I've done because they include every song so you can read different things in different moods. Um, oh, who can I mention? Uh, African writers, whether we talk about uh, Gugu Bakyongo or Chino Achebe or Olesho Inka, there, there are Caribbean writers, whether you're talking about uh, uh, Lovelace, or you know, there are so many different writers, and uh, Amer African American. I, I don't know why I'm, I'm focusing on on black writers, but you know there are people like James Baldwin, who's also full of wisdom. So th there are, there are writers who have brought me where I am. And I, I'd like to say as well, and we talked about people being inspirational, and I can remember very clearly when I was at school, so it's probably about 1961, coming across, I used to read this uh, literary journal called John of London. And one day or one week, it had on the cover, a photograph of a black African woman called Noni Jababu. She was a South African woman and she was just uh, having her first uh, memoir published. And she also became, uh, uh, she was a, a, a sort of uh, important figure in literary circles in in Britain, in London. And so she was an inspiration because I, I for the first time, saw that uh, a black African woman could be part of the literary scene in, in England, which is where I found myself. Of course, later that there that became others who, who had that sort of influence. I mean, I, I, I first met Toni Morrison in the 70s. At, at that point, she was the only black editor I knew. And we connected, in fact. You interviewed her at she, that point, Margaret? I, I did interview her. She was over here it, it, when Beloved was being published, the British edition of Beloved was being published in, I think it was the, in 1987 or thereabouts. In fact, there was um, a possibility that she and I were going to be interviewed on some television program to do with editing. And then at the last minute, the item was dropped because you know, the perception was that, well, I guess that neither of us were that important or Tony wasn't important, wasn't famous enough. And so we were really shocked at this, uh, my friends and I, because Tony had been writing novels, you know, for well over 15 years at that point. And so there was a young filmmaker called Amelie Bridgelow who, together with, uh, but Tony had an hour free in her, so we didn't film. So I didn't have time to reread the books. Cinder produced it. We, we made our own film. And we sold it eventually to Channel 4. I think it was sold to the Bandung. I can't remember before. And Tony went on and she won the Pulitzer Prize. And she went on and won the Nobel Prize in, in 1993. In fact, even when she won the Nobel Prize, she was not as well known as you might have thought she would be because she was clearly not known in the literary establishment to the extent that my phone was going all the time saying, oh, can I have four o'clock about Toni Morrison, you know, who just won the Nobel Prize because nobody else was available who knew her work. And at, that, at one point, somebody said to me, Toni Morrison, who's he? So, yes, Toni was a great inspiration. She, she, she continued to be. And she, you know, she, she did a lot as an editor, as well as as a writer, in terms of taking on Black writers that she thought needed to be published. She was working with Random House. But I remember her conversation when she told me that she had to make sure that any black writer she took on was successful because otherwise the perception might be that black writers didn't sell. So she certainly made a difference in terms of what she did as an editor, as what she did as a creative writer. So she's certainly somebody, um, you, will, you know, she, she will be in my top list of people that you're talking about, books she's written or influences. Yeah, yeah, so, 
I would direct people to read all her essays as well as her novels. Yeah. Particularly a, a book I, I read often, which is called Playing in the Dark. Whiteness and the literary imagination. It's just full of a lot of full of a lot of wisdom. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, we were, we were both doing what we did at the same time. I was an editor at the same time as she was an editor, and we connected. In fact, I, I remember um, that Jessica told me. Is that Jessica Huntley. Uh, I'm not, uh, Jessica Huntley. We 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 um, met Tony. In fact, we were at some event. Uh, Tony was speaking, and we were, Jessica was at the back of the hall. We were both at the back, and we both had we couldn't hear very well. So Jessica would say to me, "You know, what does she say?" And I said, "I don't know. I was going to ask you." <laughs> and then, and then Jessica said she invited Tony to supper, and uh, Tony came to supper, and and she was talking. They had quite a soft voice, but by the time she'd had supper, she was talking quite loudly, and Jessica said she. She said something to Tony about this and what made a difference. And she, Jessica says, although Tony didn't necessarily confirm this, what made a difference? Rice and peas. <laughs> she said, <laughs> "I'm going to I'm going to come in there because I have a couple more questions, but I am going to concur because I heard that story also from Jessica, and, and I yeah. So she, she's she's kept on that story about the difference that supper made, that meal made to, to Tony when she came around to the house for something to eat." Just a couple more, and then I'm going to go backwards to ask you to choose um, just one of the items. And that is um, a question that's come up is, has Bernadine Evaristo and Rennie Edoulodge success singled a turning, single out a turning point for black writers and black publishing? What do you think? Have they, have they, you know, have their, sorry, have what was the question again? Have their successes, you know, both these um, individuals, have their successes actually you know, singled out or pointed out a turning point for black writers and for black publishers? Well, I, I think it, we, it remains to be seen. I, I think we have to remember that although those two writers you mentioned have, have suffered the, the, the attention they deserve, there are a lot of writers who get to be given the attention they deserve for a long time, and and you, you we know that last year marked the kind of terms of the awareness of the Black White Lives Matter movement, and I think that has made for a lot of a lot of um, concern, perhaps, amongst the in, the publishing industry about how to try and do better. And I think it's wonderful that that Bernadine and Rene are, are both top bestseller lists in, in, in that year. But what we have to hope for is that it's not just a passing thing, that next year things will revert to where they've always been, which is something that was summed up for me by uh, something I was told when I was promoting New Daughters of Africa in, in 2019, and I was at some, um, some festival, and a person in the audience um, said that they'd heard the publisher talk about you know, the publishing world and had actually referred to normal books and diverse books. In other words, normal books did not include us. And so we have to hope that whatever change we see happening now, and it, it's wonderful that a lot of younger people are, are now connecting with the movement and, and pushing for what should be our rights in, in the literary world as well as outside it. So we are to, we, we hope that this will continue. It will not just be a passing, you know, gesture that, that makes people feel good about themselves, but something that people will make people think about what has been so long to get to where we are. Right, thank and how to sustain those successes that we have seen in Bernadine and Rene and, and in many other writers. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Now the last, and just going backwards, because you've talked about some, you know, I've called it items, we know that it's just really about sayings or 
thoughts or you know music books if you could only choose one of not if you could i'm going to ask you to choose one only of those that you feel would be the one you most want to pass on to anyone who is on the path they may not have got as far along the path as you have but we're on the path which of those would you pass on as a legacy please i think the sayings that sum up the way you live your life are possibly more important than any one object so i think if, if we even try to plant trees under which we will not necessarily sit ourselves in other words to share what we have to try and see how we can benefit future generations as well as us as well as doing things for us as individuals i'm not doing what i do so that i can become rich and famous i'm doing what i do because i believe it's the right thing to do and i want to share anything i have with other people who may benefit and or may may like to know may may enjoy knowing some of the things that i, I would like to share with them so there are benefits and, and there's pleasures to be had from sharing and to pass on whatever you know to other people to share whatever you know with other people without expecting any kind of reward is is something that i think we should all think about we may not, may not all be able to achieve all this but we should certainly think about why are you doing this are you doing it for yourself mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. other people as well as yourself Thank you very much, Margaret. Thank you so much for that. And again, as I said, in over the years, um, it, it has been seen so much about how your life has been one of giving and supporting. And whether you have, and I know you have heard it often, but those who are the recipient, they're not tired of saying it. Um, and, and it's been absolutely absolutely wonderful i mean say so in the chat a number of people they are you know some people are seeking further interviews some are seeking for you to give advice on various on various um other areas and you know i'll speak on your behalf you're tremendously busy but you always reach out and help and that that's a that's a fantastic legacy that you're going to leave um I do, let's just check if there are any others that any other questions just before we move on because we're coming towards closing any one last Okay, folks, well, I'm going to say thank you very much indeed, Margaret. It has been an absolute, absolute delight. Um, I don't want to taint it by apologizing for getting you in here late into the room and getting things messed up, but it's been so wonderful. And I know that we'd love to hear from you again. And, and when and until then, join us at our other events because you've been very supportive. So thank you so much indeed. I'm going to now hand over and, and ask Celia to come in and just perform her song for us. Thank you again, Margaret. All power to you. Thank you. Let's just add in my thanks, Margaret. It's been very interesting listening to your life story and what thanks, has inspired you. You. Um, you spoke about Stevie Wonder, um, and I know that he, he is a big advocate for civil rights, um, which is something very dear to my heart. And someone else who, um, who was also a very big advocate for civil rights is um, Nina Simone and I want to sing a Nina Simone song this evening if that's okay. to be free I wish I could break all the chains holding me and I wish I could say all the things that I should say say them aloud say them clear for the whole wide world to hear I wish 
I could share all the love that's in my heart to move all the bars that keep us apart. I wish I could know what it means to be me. Then you'd see and agree that every man should be free. I wish I could give all I'm longing to give. I wish I could live like I'm longing to live. And I wish I could do all the things that I can do. Though I'm away overdue, I'd be starting anew. Well, I wish I could be like a bird in the sky. How sweet it would be if I thought I could fly. I'd soar to the sun and look down at the sea. And I'd sing, cause I know. Yes, I'd sing, cause I know. I'm gonna sing, cause I know. I'm gonna dance, cause I know. Yeah, I'm gonna shout, cause I know I'm gonna sing, cause I know I'm gonna sing, cause I know How it feels to be free How it feels to be free Whoa, now that was Celia Wickham Anderson. Celia, one of the members of Black Voices, that absolutely wonderful international um, a cappella group. Uh, this time they'll sing into us with some backing music. It is always fantastic to listen to you, Celia, and it is wonderful. Margaret, it has been a pleasure, an honor. And, you know, those people who came in and have been waiting and waiting to hear from you. I'm sure that they've had a wonderful, wonderful time listening. So thank you again, Margaret. Thank you, Celia. And just Thanks for inviting we... me, Marge. Oh, gosh, I, it's, it's been such a pleasure. It's been all mine. It's, you know, I know there are other people looking and listening, but it's been my pleasure. I, I now want to just tell you about what's coming next. We do hope that you have enjoyed this evening with us and that it's been inspirational. And as William said at the beginning, we, d we have other events that are planned. Uh, in two months time, we have another Black Pack interview following very much the same format in terms of having another giant who will join us, whom we can ask about their life and find out more about their journey and some of the wisdom, the tools, the ways of life that have sustained them. But for now, I'd like to share with you the absolute next um, event that we're having, and that's going to be on the 27th of February. So right at the end of the month, and it will be towards the end of the, you know, uh, Black History Month in, in the USA. And this one, it's critical conversations. I know if you are on and most of you are on very early that William have spoken about this already, but I'm just, you know, you can see it on the screen. So please put it in your diary. It promises to be a very powerful event. It is very different from what we've had, um, but it's very going to be very powerful nonetheless, where we're having some specialists in their field, speaking with us, having a debate, taking questions uh, about, as it says, state of the race, looking at the issues and how they present themselves at the present time in terms of the African diaspora and some of the issues that we are facing at this time um, in Earth's history, in our generational history and where we're from. So please, 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 um, I'm inviting you, I'm saying to go on the website, uh, Quick Crack website, where you'll find more information. I'm also saying to you that check out in, in Eventbrite. And also when you go on to Quick Crack, will you please, we'll be very grateful if you will like the page, but more importantly, if you will subscribe so that next time when this is coming up, we can remind you so that you can come along and join us. So thank you very much indeed. It's been a great, great pleasure to be here. I thank you because we couldn't do this without you. And it is always a pleasure at this time when we get together 
as a people to learn from those who have gone ahead, from those who have done things that we aspire to, that encourages us and who are willing to share it with us. So thank you, blessings, and I hope to see you again very, very soon. Great. Um, good night, everybody. Um, just wanted to add my thanks, Margaret. You know, when they say um, you confer on somebody a, a knighthood as our first Black Pack host, <laughs> we want to confer on you uh, the order of the Black Hood, the <laughs> services to our community that we greatly oh, appreciate. Thank you. I gratefully yeah. accept. <laughs> Okay. So people can um, put their cameras on and give them some claps and thank our wonderful interviewee tonight, uh, Margaret Busby, as we listen to some music as we go out. So have a enjoy the rest of your evening.